Amateurism is officially dead. The sham is over. The hoax is over. The House and the NCAA came to an agreement on revenue sharing. We're going to touch here shortly on how that's going to affect recruiting and the game moving forward. Amateurism, though, as you have known it in the past, is officially dead, and it's time to turn the page. We're going to welcome in right now Chris Homer. Chris, how you doing? Thanks for joining us. Doing good, y'all. Doing good. Amateurism is uh, it's dead and buried. It's been buried for a long time, but this was just like the last little bit of dirt right on top of that thing. Like players are already getting paid like five hundred to two million dollars in some cases. Like amateurism's been dead for a while, but this is still a pretty massive change for college athletics. Well, Chris, you you already kind of jumped into it, leading into it. How does this settlement affect the student athlete? It affects it in a lot of ways. Um, for football, I think you're going to see the most drastic changes. Uh, athletes straight up are just going to get paid a lot more money. Uh, athletes had always been deserving of a piece of the pie, in my opinion. They are the reason this NCAA culture exists in which teams and schools and conferences are raking in millions of dollars a year. They always deserve part of that. Now they're going to get it via revenue sharing. Um, schools are going to have to pay out essentially 20% of their television revenue to the student athletes every year. And when you throw in all the extra benefits the student athletes get um, in terms of their cost of uh, attendance stipends, their scholarships, their room and board, their food, it gets things closer to a 50 50 revenue split like you would see in professional sports leagues like the NFL. Um, so now instead of players making a couple thousand dollars a year um, in some cases or on the high end, a couple hundred thousand. Uh, for some other players, you're going to see salary caps of 20 to $22 million. Um, so it really changes the sport. Chris, which conference is this proposal truly affecting? Uh, just the power four. Um, it really affects everyone, right? Because this separates the haves and the haves nots. Uh, conferences outside the power four are just not going to be able to keep up. They were already struggling to do so. It's really hard right now for a G5 team to hold on to a player. If a power four team wants them, uh, there's no way to match those dollars dollar for dollar, but you can kind of uh, get creative to make things work. Places like Western Kentucky, I think have done a really excellent job holding onto their players in those situations, but the money now is just going to be drastic right now. An upper end NIL program, I think it's going to put you in the 10 to $15 million range per roster per year. Now the floor is going to be 20 to $22 million. And there's a lot of G five schools that don't even have, um, annual revenues of 20 to 25 million dollars so they're not even going to be in the same ballpark anymore they're not in the same universe anymore in terms of spending so this is something that's going to really affect the power four and how they have to budget but if anything it really separates the power four from the group of five even more chris how will programs be held liable and how will it affect roster structure and scholarships well, the liability is, I mean, I'm sure there's like, we've seen courts affect all this. We're talking, I, I never anticipated talking so much about lawyers and lawsuits in my entire life when I signed up to cover college football. So that is part of this, like colleges are going to have to live up to their end of the bargain. But at the end of the day, like they're going to have to pay out $20 million to their athletes. Otherwise their athletes are going to go somewhere else. So that's how athletes or how teams are going to be held liable. In terms of roster sizes, I think we're going to see a reduction, at least in football. Um, schools are going to look for ways to save money. Um, $20 million is a lot more than zero, and schools are going to have to find that money from somewhere. A lot of it will come from increased revenues that they get from television contracts. But I think you can see a situation in which roster sizes go from 125 to 85 or 90. And I think walk-ons, in a lot of cases, and we've seen a report from Yahoo's Ross Dellinger, are the ones who are going to get squeezed. Um, I can see roster sizes in football dropping drastically, but in other sports like baseball, where they only get like 11.7 scholarships for a 30 man roster, I think you might see those increase drastically as well. Uh, but football, I think you're going to see a squeeze. Chris, how is this proposal for pay for play um, affected? How is it going to affect the pay for play scenario that we have right now? Does pay for play happen in college football in 2024? <laughs> my bad, my bad. Um, yeah, I mean, pay-for-play has always been kind of the bugaboo of the NCAA. It's happened forever. I'm sure Smoke back in the day had some really nice rides at Alabama or something like that. But in general, pay-for-play under the new rule set, which has been negotiated in this lawsuit, should go away. And I put that in quotation marks. NIL 
is supposed to go back to what it was created to be in the first place which is something for fair market value for your name, image, and likeness, what you bring from a brand perspective. What we see now is something very different from that. It's players getting paid for their on-field value via NIL deals. And I put that in quotation mark for a reason. So it's a matter of enforcement. It's just a question of whether enforcement comes about. The NCAA has not shown the ability to enforce NIL. And I think for NIL enforcement to really step up, you would have to have an outside entity um, enter into that role. I don't know if that's the conferences. I don't know if it's a third party uh, designated to make sure that the rules are followed because we're not talking about NIL anymore. We're talking about salary cap and fairness within a salary cap. And I don't think a lot of schools are going to be happy if, let's say, an SEC school ends up spending $40 million because they come up with $20 million in NIL to boost their roster. So I think that's one of the biggest questions. So, Chris, all of those people that are, are tweeting at me and in my DMs that are upset because I say the collective won't have the same value and, and those things will be invalidated. They're supposed to have a salary cap, correct? It's a pseudo salary cap, but it's a salary cap, right? Like it's $22 million, give or take. That is the number. I believe schools will be allowed to spend more if they'd like to, but I think what you're going to see is conferences and the power four as a whole come to an agreement to essentially mandate fairness. So that is supposed to be the floor and the ceiling, right? Um, the collectives are there to potentially fill in the gaps and give schools a little bit of an extra boost. But I think the way they've designed this in this lawsuit and in the settlement is to take the collectives more out of the equation. I think what you're going to see is a lot more collectives go in-house and schools take control of the collective arm. They won't have an outside entity enforce, er, essentially paying athletes for them. They will take over that element of things. And I think there's also a hope that it uh, reigns in a little bit of the chaos that you get with collectives in this environment. Um, I don't think anybody thinks the Jaden Rashada situation, for example, that happened this week with the lawsuit is a good look for college athletics and a good look for Florida. And I think there's a hope that schools can kind of rein in some of the uh, chaos that comes with that. I know a lot of folks in the collective space would push back against that. And I think they'll certainly still have a role. But I think the design, at least from those at the top of college athletics, is to maybe blunt a little bit of that and take more control back in-house. Well, there you have it. Chris said it. That means get out my DMs and out my mentions with the, hey, Chris just cleared that up for you. And I thank you so much, my brother, for coming on. You always on top of these type of stories. Chris Hummer, make sure you follow him on X and on all social media, wealth of information, especially if you want to know anything about who's going in the transfer portal, what coaching changes are happening. I refresh his page at least five times a day. Smoke, what's your thoughts on this, man? Like, where, where are you at with this? Well, we got to be mindful and real careful of what we're asking for. And that's the coaches, players, collective, everyone that's involved with this matter, because when you start going to court, there's things that's going to happen that's taking away what college football is. And it's one of the more more games that you, when you look at it, it's pure. You're taking the purity away from it because you're getting into the business aspect of it. And I always go back when we, I talk about the college side and the, and the professional side. And I'll give you, and I'll give you a story. When I was a junior and I, at University of Alabama, we had a leadership council. And there was a player on the team that was going to get kicked off. And Coach Fran brought us all in. And then he went, left the room to bring in the player. By the time that he went in, right, left the room to bring in the player, we all sat in there, all 12 of us sat in there and said, hey, listen, we can't let this young man go back home. Because if he goes back home, he's going to get in trouble. We don't know what's going to happen to him. Let's try our best to keep him in. That's a college form of it. Now, working with the Buffalo Bills for seven years, I sat around those tables on cut down day. And buddy, if you weren't good enough to help the team, you got cut and got removed. So we have to be careful of getting to the business side of it for amateur players or college athletes and not push it over to the business side of it, which is the NFL. There's a happy medium. Everybody can get what they want to get. But when we start cutting that edge and making it real close to getting collegiate players, trying to be, make professionals, you're going to remove the raw emotion and the developmental standpoint of young people that we truly care about. 
and that's a college player. This game is going in the wrong direction. We need to get this thing before it gets bad. Your thoughts, Carl? Smoke, I think is is uh, we've been coming in this direction for a while. When we started with NIL, when we started with this whole collective pay for play thing, there was they were always going to have to come find a solution. You got big time attorneys that are going through the process of working it out. There's still plenty of details left that have to be figured out on how this thing is going to move forward. But the bottom line is the revenue is going to come from the players. Now we're a football show, but I always worry about as a person who's an advocate for kids, how decisions like this are going to affect the non-revenue sports, the baseball players, the swimmers, the wrestlers, the people who depend on the scholarship money and the assistance that they do get. If this is going to force programs to drop certain sports or maybe send them to the club level because they want to give the most of the money to the football and the men's basketball players. And now, even the women's basketball players is that has become the next big thing.